Welcome, everyone. Today's lesson is factoring patterns. Factoring is one of those skill sets that's quite prevalent in a high school math curriculum, and it's a necessity for us to master this skill set as we look to explore different types of equations and functions over the course of our curriculum. So it should be noted with this particular lesson that most of these patterns that you're going to see are, are, should be a review. You've definitely seen these before in your Algebra 1 and Algebra 2 classes. It's just at the very end of the lesson that I kind of raise the bar a little bit and do some pre-calc level um, factoring problems. So I'm going to treat it as a review lesson and go through some of these pretty quickly. But if you ever need a little extra help on some of these, please don't hesitate to ask. All right. Uh, factoring really comes down to, to two pieces. It's recognizing the pattern to use and then applying that pattern. And so we're going to start out with uh, number one of um, your paper here, which says the greatest common factor. And as it says, it's bolded, it's capped, it's got, got an exclamation point. How about underline it too? Whenever you see the word factor, you always look at least to do this first. If you can, great, you apply it. If you can't, then you try a different pattern. So I think of the greatest common factor is very simply the reverse of the distributive property. So if you think about distributing into the parentheses, this is essentially factoring out of the parentheses. So reverse of the distributive property. And just an example to get us going here. So to factor the polynomial x 18x to the fourth minus 38 squared. And this is written in what we would call standard form. It is the difference of two monomials. And so what we are going to do is manipulate this expression and rewrite it into factored form. Factored form means a product, essentially, multiplication. So we're going to write this expression as a product of its factors. And so what I do, and I encourage you to do this on paper, very lightly circle the 18x to the fourth, and then very lightly circle the 30x squared. And what we're asking ourselves is, what is the greatest common factor to both those terms? Well, I look at the uh, coefficients here, the 18 and the 30, and I see that 6 is the largest value that would divide evenly into them. So I'm going to pull out a 6. And then I look at the powers of x. I have x to the fourth in this particular term, x squared in this particular term, and the largest power that would divide evenly into them would be x squared, so I take out x squared from each term. And once that greatest common factor comes out, I build my parentheses to see what are the remaining factors after this has come out of each term. So I kind of look at it working left to right here. I took out a 6 from this 18, so I still have a factor of 3 in there. 6 times 3 gives us the 18. I took out x squared from x to the fourth, so it looks like I have two factors of x in there, so that would be x squared. And again, x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. Here's my minus. Looks like I took out a 6 from this 30, so I still have a factor of 5. And I took out all of the powers of x from x squared, so there are no powers of x remaining in the parentheses. And there we go. So this is the factored form of the polynomial that was given. 6 times x times x times this binomial, 3x squared minus 5. Now, I want you to keep in mind what we did here for this one, because the process for this one is going to be very similar when I raise the bar on the very back side of your notes first. All right, in the meantime, let's move on to number two, quadratic trinomials. So quadratic means a degree two polynomial. Trinomial means three terms, one, two, and three. And when we just have a coefficient of one in front of the x squared, it's pretty straightforward. So here's what I would have you write, and then we'll go for it. I think of this as just the reverse of foiling. So remember first, outside, inside, last, of course. And the little rule of thumb that we're going to use here is to look for two numbers that Multiply to C, so that's this value right here, so we need two numbers that multiply to C and add to B. 
So when I'm looking for my combination, when I get to factoring here, I'm looking for two numbers that will multiply to this and add to this. All right, so let me jump into example two. A couple pretty straightforward ones here. So it says factor each polynomial. And same idea, this is a nice quadratic trinomial. I will try to practice what I preach here. If you remember, I said when we see the word factor, we always want to at least look for a greatest common factor. So I look at this, and I look at this, and I look at this, those three terms. But is there anything that I can pull out that is going to be meaningful for us? No, there is no common factor that's going to help us here, um, only with something outside of parentheses. So, unfortunately, no greatest common factor. So then I go into this pattern. And when I say reverse the foiling, what I'm doing essentially is just creating two binomials. So one binomial times another. And as you probably do remember, if I'm looking for uh, two values that multiply to x squared, of course, that's got to be x and x. So that should go in without question. And then our rule of thumb is this. I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to negative 18 and add to positive 3. If I can get that combination, that goes here and here, and I should be ready to roll. So just to keep it moving, hopefully you saw this too. Looks like a plus 6 and a minus 3 would keep it. And if I was wondering if I got this right, I could always foil this back out. And by foiling it back out, I should get this in standard form. So remember, everybody, standard form, factor form. Box that up. And one thing I want you to just realize before we hit, hit it the next one, the outside and inside piece. We're going to talk a lot about that, especially as we get into the next piece. But outside and inside should combine to that middle term right there. That's why we get that negative 3x and positive 6x. That's what combines to a plus 3x. All right, everybody, go ahead and do part B for me, if you would. Take a moment. And there's a reason I put this one in play. So when you did factor this, of course, no greatest common factor. So I just make my two binomials, x and x. And it looks like minus 5 and minus 5 would be the trick there. Now, if you left it like that for right now, that's totally fine. What I want you to recognize in this particular case is we ended up getting the same factor twice. And so it's this times itself. And so if you left it like that, as I said, all good, but we can rewrite it in a slightly different fashion, and it means the same thing. Anything times itself means squared. And so I could write that as x minus 5 squared. Now, again, either way would be fine right now, but we're going to start to work with quadratic equations where factoring something like this and writing it like this is actually going to be imperative for us. So I just want you to see that piece, that this can be written like this. This happens to be what is called a perfect square trinomial. And it's a specific, specific excuse me, type of quadratic trinomial that factors into what is called the square of a binomial. And that's going to be helpful, as I said, when we do some solving quadratics. All right, very good. Let's move on to number three. So now, same idea, quadratics. If you would, how about you underline the A right there, because that's the only issue. So what happens when I have a coefficient other than 1 in front of the x squared? It becomes a little more complicated. And so, but the premise is the same. It's still just reverse of foiling. Now, there are actually a few different methods here. So I would note just that there were a couple, but actually there are more than a couple. Um, but, with that being said, the two that I am going to focus on are the ones that I wrote right here. So that's the reason I wrote the couple. So if your number sense is good, trial and error is definitely the way to go. And I'm going to show you that in just a second. I have a method that I found that I really like. And I kind of took credit for it, although I probably shouldn't have. I didn't invent the method, but I did find it. And I'm the only one in the department that actually uses this method. So that's why I'm taking credit for it. And so the idea is I'm going to show it to you. If you like it, great, use it. If you don't like it, no harm done. Um, use the method that you learned last year. Use trial and error. I don't care. It does not matter. But you should be able to factor these types of quadratics pretty cleanly and quickly. So I just want that uh, 
Make sure you understand that piece. All right, so let's get into part A. I'm going to just do trial, excuse me, trial and error on this one, show you what that means, and then I'll show you what that So, trial and error. We set up our binary. And I think to myself, okay, I'm looking for two values that would multiply the 2x squared. That would have to go here and here. And that's good because there really aren't any combinations other than 2x and x that are going to work there. And so then I start to think about, well, I need two numbers that will multiply to negative 6. That's going to go here and here. The problem, of course, is I have different combinations that might work. Could be a 1 and a 6, could be a 2 and a 3, or a 3 and a 2, or a 6 and a 1. And there are probably ways that we can narrow down the field even right off the bat. But forgetting that for a moment, you would basically trial and error. You would say, all right, well, I'm going to try a 1 and a 6. And uh, I know it has to multiply to a negative, so one of them has to be positive and the other has to be negative. And if you're unsure, you could just try it out there. And then you would wonder, hey, do I, did I get it right? And the way to check would be doing the outside and the inside. And the outside and the inside, as mentioned prior to this, has to combine to negative 1x. And if you notice, it does not, because I've got negative 12x on the outside, positive 1x on the inside, that's not going to combine to a negative 1x. And so, unfortunately, it didn't work. So I kind of start a little bit from scratch there, and then I go ahead and just try it again. I know it's got to be 2x and x, that hasn't changed. So I try another combination, I'm going to go 3 and 2, and I'm going to put a plus here and a minus here. And as I look to check, I would say outside is negative 4x. There we go. Inside is positive 3x, ooh, negative 4x positive 3x, when I combine them, I get this. And so I know I got it right. By just looking at what this would be foiled out, it is this right here. So again, that's trial and error. What I am going to do now, though, is to show you a different method, most likely one that you have not seen before. And as I said, you might like it, you might not. You'll just have to see it. All right, so here's how it works. Um, in fact, I'm going to erase. So you have the uh, answer there. Just keep that in mind, of course. And I'm going to show you how this works. So nobody likes the number in front of the x squared. So I want you to very likely just circle. And for the moment, we're going to bring it to the back side. And when I bring it to the back side, what I mean by that is we're going to rewrite the expression as now an x squared minus x. And now the 2 times negative 6 would give us minus 12. And that's what I mean by bringing it over to the back side. Multiplying those two together goes right here. Now this should be pretty easy for us. So I'm going to make my two binomials. And I want you to leave a little room in front. But we're going to put an x there and an x there. But leave a little room in front of each one. And as I said, this is relatively easy because all I'm looking for would be two numbers that multiply to negative 12 and add to negative 1. Well, that has to be a minus 4 and a plus 3. So I put that in. Now the problem, of course, is this factored version right here is not of the original expression, because the original expression had the 2x squared. So what I do is I overcompensate. I put the 2 in both slots. And I deliberately do it wrong because I'm unsure of where it goes. Because I know 2 times 2 is 4. It's not 2. So I overcompensate. So what I need to do is get rid of anything that's extra. So later I'll put a little division symbol under each. And ask yourself, well, what does divide into these two numbers right here? 2. What divides into these two numbers right here? 1. And then when I do the division, 2x over 2 is just x minus 4 divided by 2 is just 2. There's my 1 factor. And dividing by 1 doesn't change anything. There's the other one. And that should match what I put up earlier. Perfect. All right. I'm just going to go right into the next one now using my method. Again, second time. 
circle the 15, bring it on over everybody. I get x squared minus 11x plus 30. This you need to be able to factor. So, x and x, leave a little room in front, and I'm looking for two numbers that multiply positive 30 and add to negative 11. So it has to be two negative numbers. Looks like it's going to be minus 6, minus 5. Have to be able to do that. Now again, I've got to compensate for the 15. I'm going to overcompensate initially. I'm going to put a 15 back in both slots. But obviously 15 by, uh, times 15 is 225. That's not 15 x squared there. So, put a division sum, uh, symbol under each and ask yourself what divides into each of these numbers. Well, it looks like 3 will go into them. What divides into each of these numbers? Looks like 5 will go into them. And when I do that division, I get 5x minus 2, and I get 3x minus 1. So do the division in each case. There we go. This, and then this, and this should be our answer. And as I say, if you're ever unsure, just multiply it back out. And you should get it. If you do, then you know you did it right. All right, letter C. Good one here, letter C. So first order of business is to remind ourselves of what I started this lesson today. When I look at the word factoring, the first thing I think about is greatest common factor. And so before I jump to any conclusions about which pattern this might be, I ask myself, is there anything that we can pull out of all three of those terms? And to get this moving along, you can actually factor out a 2x. So, I'm going to factor out a 2x, and that would give me, inside the parentheses, a 10x squared minus 17x and a plus 3. Alright, now that's great. So when I factored out um, a value of 2 and then also a, a, a factor of x, I get this quadratic trinomial renaming. And I always, factoring is all about breaking down things further and further until they can't be broken down again. And so I look at this quadratic trinomial, and I'm going to see, and by the way, I'm going to bring down that 2x, but I'm going to see if this can factor into two binomials. So, I'm going to use my method one more time for you, see if the third time works. So everybody, I'm going to take that 10, and now I'm going to multiply it over to the other side, and so I get x squared minus 17x and plus 30. I have to be able to factor this with my two binomials. So I know it's x and x, and I leave a little room in front. I am looking for two numbers that will multiply to positive 30 and add to negative 17, and it should be minus 15 and minus 2. As we hopefully now realize, the 10 goes back in to each spot. And then I realized I did too much there. I overcompensated for that 10. So now I'm going to divide away anything extra. So what divides into both 10 and 15? Looks like a 5. What divides into both 10 and 2? Looks like a 2. And so when I do the division here, looks like I get 2x minus 3. And it looks like I get 5x minus 1. And please do not forget, we already pulled out that greatest common factor. It is part of the original expression, so it does need to be part of our answer. Absolutely. Okay, so, quadratic trinomials with a number other than 1 in front of the x squared. Doesn't matter to me um, what method you use. If you like an older method that you learned before, totally fine. If you can do trial and error, I absolutely recommend that. But if you like this great method, go for it. Okay, everybody, on to the next pattern. What's called difference of two squares. So, I guess the name speaks for itself. Difference means subtraction, two perfect squares on either side of it. 
And this factors into what's called the sum and difference pattern. So I'm just going to put it as A plus B and then A minus B. If you want to write in here sum and difference pattern, that's fine. I'm going to leave it like that for the time being. So again, you've definitely seen this before. I'm going to leave this question blank for the moment. And let's just try a couple of these examples to get us moving. So, as I said, factoring is all about recognition and application. So I look at this particular expression right here. I do not see a GCF, but I do see it is a minus symbol in between two perfect squares. And so that tells me right away it is the difference of two squares. And as soon as I see that, I make my parentheses. And then I just think about, well, what times itself would give me x squared, x and x. What times itself would give me 64, 8 and 8, and 1 plus and 1 minus. And again, guys, it's, it's a quadratic expression, so it breaks down into two linear factors, kind of reverse spoiling, right? But it, if you notice, it's the outside and inside. If I combine them, one being negative and the other being positive, um, they would cancel out. That's why there's no middle term right there. Okay, part B. Same idea. Difference, perfect square, perfect square, it's ready to roll. I recognize that. What times itself would give us 25x squared? How about 5x and 5x? What times itself gives us the 36? How about a 6 and a 6? And 1 plus, 1 minus. Okay, let's do the last one, and then I will answer this question right here. X to the fourth does happen to be a perfect square. 16, also a perfect square. So I recognize the difference of two squares. So I think about what times itself would give me X to the fourth, and it would be X squared and X squared. What times itself would be uh, 16, 4 and 4, 1 plus, and 1 minus. Now, before I do pat myself on the back for a job well done, I always want to look at my answer and ask myself, can I break it down further? Just like right here, remember, I, I saw this and I looked to break it down further. I see two quadratics and I look to break it down further. Now, it just so happens this one jumps out at me quicker, so I'm going to do this one first. That also is a difference of two perfect squares, right? Four is a perfect square. So that can be broken down into x plus 2 and x minus 2. This happens to have two perfect squares, but there's a plus in between them. This is what's called a sum of two squares. And, not to leave you in too much suspense, a sum of two squares is already prime. Can not be broken down further. So, and I'll show you this in just a moment, but is there a pattern for sum of two squares? No. It is prime. Now, don't write this on your paper, but, you know, working with students for many, many years, you see them do some interesting things. I see a lot of students go like this. They'll be like, oh, it's just, uh, you know, x times x, 2 times 2, yeah, that's a plus, so let's just do plus here and here. But, as if I ask you to do the inside and outside, do you see that this would produce a 4x? And do you see a 4x in there as well? No. So this is not that. Not at all. Get rid of it. Don't factor a sum of two squares. That is the moral of that story. Okay. Next pattern. So, um, yeah, sum or difference of two cubes. So I just got done saying that there is a difference of two squares, but no sum of two squares. When we're talking about cubes, there's both. And here is the formal pattern for it, for your convenience. I'm going to just show you a way I kind of think about it, and hopefully it'll click. If, if not, again, just, you know, go with this. It works. One thing I will have you note, though, is two, uh, two cubes, excuse me, 
two cubes break down into a small linear, large quadratic. And this large quadratic will be prime. So again, small linear, large quadratic. So as soon as I recognize, and that's a key piece, in this case, difference, perfect cube, eight is a perfect cube, then I get it going. Small linear, large quadratic. So do that as well, please, for me. And the small linear is exactly what you're thinking. It's just the linear version of this. So the cube root of x cubed is just x. The cube root of 8 is just 2. If that's minus, that's minus. So this is just the linear version of this right there. Awesome. Now I'm going to show you how to do the prime quadratic here. Prime quadratic has three parts. One, two, three. And here's what I think of. x times something has to give us x cubed. That something is what goes right here. x times x squared is what would give me x cubed. So I know this has to be x squared right here. And by the same token, on the back end, everybody, not the middle, but on the back end, negative 2 times something has to give us this negative 8. That's how factors work, right? Multiplication. Negative 2 times something has to give us negative 8. And negative 2 times positive 4 is what gives me negative 8. So I know those two pieces have to be the case. Now the middle term is the trick. It is sort of the linchpin that makes everything else just kind of cancel out when you do the multiplication. And so I'm going to give it to you first. We're going to write it here, and then we'll write the little trick below. So the trick is this. You take these two guys in the linear pair and you multiply them together. x times 2 is 2x. Whatever sign this is right here, this is the opposite. So if that's minus, that's plus. So here's how you get that middle term. Multiply linear pair together, and then it's the opposite sign. Okay. All right, look that over. And what I want you to do is come over and take a moment and recognize, first of all, 27x cubed is a perfect cube. 1 is a perfect square and perfect cube. So that'll work for both patterns. Go for it. See if you can do it. Small linear, large quadratic. All right, here's what I came up with. Linear version of this. Well, cube root of this, everybody, is 3x. Cube root of 1 is just 1. That's a plus, and so that's a plus. This is just the linear version of 27x cubed plus 1. Now, 3 times 9 is what would give me 27. x times x squared is what gives me x cubed. So this has to be a 9x squared. On the back end, 1 times 1 is what gives me 1. So that's got to be your plus 1. And then I'm going to follow my little trick from the previous example. Take this times that. So 3x times 1. So that's 3x. And if that's a plus, this has to be a minus. Okay? And by definition, guys, this quadratic is always going to be prime. So you leave it as small linear times a large quadratic. Let's box that guy up, and I'll come over and box this one up. All right. Next one, everybody. Grouping. So how many terms do you have when we look to group? One, two, three, four terms. Okay. Pretty cool. So let's try grouping. So here's what I would say. Grouping is, is just really based on greatest common factor, but we're just going to start the process by grouping the terms into pairs. And then just use the concept of greatest common Now, this can be done a couple different ways. I, I like it in this particular visual way. 
But if you look at now for two in a slightly different fashion, no worries whatsoever. So here's what I'm thinking. First two terms, grouping, grouping symbols are parentheses, so put parentheses around those two. Now I like doing the parentheses right after the, the last one, so just kind of back to back there. I like doing it like that. Other teachers maybe do it in a slightly different fashion. To me, this is just a little cleaner, but again, that's just uh, my perspective on it. So, two pants. Now we're going to go all GCF on this. So what I want you to do is think about just these two values right here. Is there a greatest common factor to those two terms? And the answer is yes. I can pull out an x squared from each of them. So you're going to pull out an x squared from here and here, and when you do, you get a 3x plus 4. Then I go to my second pair, and I ask, is there a greatest common factor to both of those? Now, if this is a negative, you do want to pull out the negative with it. So I'm going to pull out a negative 2, or a minus 2 here. And when I pull out the negative 2, that turns this to a positive, 3x as a matter of fact, but it also turns this into a positive, positive 4, right? Because negative 2 times positive 4 is what gives me negative 8. If I can pull that off, pulling out the right term and the right sign, and this is the same as this, then you know it can be done by group. And so now it literally is just greatest common factor here. Very likely on your paper. I want you to circle this, very likely. And then after the minus, circle this. And what you have are two terms made up of factors. And in each case, this one and this one, each one of those has a 3x plus 4. And so what you're doing is factoring out the greatest common factor. It just so happens the greatest common factor is a binomial. There's a 3x plus 4 in this term, and there's a 3x plus 4 in this term. So when I factor out the 3x uh, plus 4, I look to see what's left. Well, I have x squared here. I have a minus symbol there. And then from here, since I took out this, I just got rid of it. That's grouping. That's potentially what you remember. Awesome. Let's go do this one together. Parentheses around that. Backing it up, parentheses around that. So, greatest common factor here, looks like I can pull out an x cubed, and I get x minus 1 as a result. Now, you're looking at this, and you're thinking, well, there's really nothing to pull out. For us to do this in a very visual fashion, you actually do need to pull out the positive 1. So, I literally will pull out a plus 1 right there, and when I do, of course, it just stays as x minus 1. So I did this for a reason, so you can see that if you don't see you can pull anything out, you do want to pull out the plus 1. And now you see, oh, that has the same as that. Perfect. So if you notice, two terms, very lightly circle this one. Very lightly circle that one. Two terms separated by that plus. And... Each of those terms has an x minus 1 in it. And so I pull out the x minus 1. And when I do that, I get x cubed, I get my plus right here, and then I get the 1. Now, if you left it like this, good, but not great. As I always say, factoring is about recognition and then application. And I recognize this right here happens to be a sum of two perfect cubes. So in reality, that can be broken down further based on what we did in the previous example. Now I'm just going to do this to get it moving. Small linear, large quadratic, linear version in here. One is a perfect cube, so there we go. And then this would be x squared. It would be minus 1x, based on my trick, and then plus 1. Sometimes, I was kind of looking to go further. 
And in that case, we couldn't. Alright? So, hopefully you've been doing pretty well with these. Again, up to this point in time, you've at least been exposed to all of those um, factoring patterns before. So now I'm beginning to you the pre-calc level. Now what makes this pre-calc level is not the pattern itself. It's just the terms in them that are a little harder to do. So I'm going to walk you through it as best I can, and we'll go from there. So it's just greatest common factor. So here's what I want you to write in here. The GCF of any powers in the same base. is the one with the smallest exponent. Alright, just keep that in mind. And this should correspond with, you know, what you've always learned with this. Like, I'll just go back super fast here. I go back to my first board. If I asked you, like, powers of x, and I said, what's the greatest common factor of x to the fourth and x squared that you're going to pull out? You would just take the smaller of the two, right? The greatest common factor of any two powers is the one with the smaller exponent. That's it. It just so happens, instead of four and two, you're going to see some more complicated exponents. Three halves and one half. Negative two thirds and one third. But the idea is the same. So just remember that the greatest common factor of any powers in the same base is very simply the one with the smallest exponent. So, not factoring completely yet, just think of it our GCF, and then we'll get into the last one of the day. So what's the GCF here? Well, coefficients, I know I can pull out an 8 from 16 and 24, and then I have two powers of x. And so I just look at the two powers of x, and rather than freaking out about fractional exponents, I just say, you know what? The greatest common factor is the power with the smaller exponent. So just be x to the one half. That's it. So when I see two powers over here with the same base, in this case the base is x plus 1, it doesn't matter what the base is, in this case it's x plus 1, if I'm looking for the greatest common factor, it's just the one with the smaller exponent. So what's the smaller exponent? Obviously, negative two-thirds is smaller than positive one-third. Okay, keep that in mind, and then we can get this last one. Alright, so I'm going to use this little, it's not a trick, but this terminology. So none, sum, or all. You'll just hear me use this during the lesson, and if you ask me for help individually, I'll be using this same terminology too to keep it consistent. So just kind of keep that in mind, okay? All right, we're going to factor. So you ready for it? Two terms separated by that minus right there. I'm looking for the greatest common factor. So I look at the coefficients, of course, and I pull out a 6. I see that in each term, there is a power with base x. And so the greatest common factor, as we now know, is the smaller of the two. So I hope you do realize at this stage that I would pull out x to the one-fourth from here and from here. And when I do that, now I make my parentheses because it's just GCF. And here's what I mean by none, sum, or all. So I'm going to work left to right and I'm going to figure out what needs to remain inside the parentheses. So here's what I'm thinking. I start with a six. Did I take none of it out, some of it out, or all of it out? And I took out all of the six, right? There it is. So there's no coefficient there. I think there's a one there if I wanted to, and if I needed it. But there's a factor of one there. Now, here's the key. Did I take some of the x to the three-fourths out, or all of the x to the three-fourths out? Well, I took out some of it, because I took out something smaller than x to the three-fourths. I took out x to the one fourth. So when I say, hey, I only took out some of it, then that means I still have some x's inside the parentheses here. So immediately put an x. 
And now I need to think about what that x is going to be raised to. And so I think about it as this times this has to give me the original. And so I'm just going to work quickly off to the side. You'll get better and better at this. But I'm thinking it's got to be something like this right here. The original over what we took out. And of course, we keep the base, we've done this before, and we subtract the exponents. So 3 fourths minus 1 fourth is 2 fourths. And so now I realize that that has to be x to the 1 half, right? 2 over 4 is 1 over 2. So at the end of the day, I put the x there, because I know I still have some x's in, and I subtract the exponents. 3 fourths minus 1 fourth is 2 fourths. Alright? Then I keep going left to right. There's the minus. So that I take out some or all of the 12. Well, I only took out some of the 12, so I still have some values in there. Looks like it's 2. And did I take some or all of the x to the 1 fourth out? I took all of it out. So there's no x fine. Box it up. Cool. Let's go to the next one. Letter B. Two powers with the same base. The greatest common factor is the lower of the two powers. So x to the negative 3 halves is actually smaller than x to the negative 1 half. So this is the greatest common factor. Then I make my parentheses. And I'm going to work left to right, and I'm going to ask myself, did I take some of this power out or all of it out? Well, if you take a look, I took out something smaller than the original. Negative 3 halves is smaller than negative 1 halves. So I only took out some of the x plus 3. So what that means is I still have some x plus 3s in there. So right x plus 3 on the left side of the parentheses. Now what's that x plus 3 going to be raised to? So I take the original exponent minus this exponent right here. So negative 1 half minus negative 3 halves. So I'm going to erase this in a second, but that's what I would be thinking to myself. Subtracting a negative is like adding a positive. And so that means I end up getting positive 2 halves, which means this is to the first power. So this means it's x plus 3 to the first. Hopefully you see that piece. Okay. Excellent. So if anything's to the first power, I just leave it as it is. Alright, now I'll put a minus. Here's my minus. Now, did I take some or all of that x plus 3 to the negative 3 halves out? Well, I took all of it out. So there are no x plus 3's back here, because I took them all. There they are. But there is a factor remaining, of course. Remember, this times something has to give me the original, so it's times 1. And so now, guys, we play cleanup. x plus 3 halves, uh, I'm sorry, x plus 3 to the negative 3 halves, and then I simplify here and I get x plus 2. Now notice what it says. Write your answers with positive exponents only. This power right here has a negative exponent. We know how to deal with that. We bring it to the denominator. So you can start to see a lot of cool things come together already with what we've been learning. There's your answer. Alright, let's go try one more. Deep breath. Let's see if we can pull this one off. Greatest common factor. Two terms. If it helps you, lightly circle this. And then after the plus, lightly circle that. What's the greatest common factor of 2 and 4? 2. What's the greatest common factor of x and x squared? x. Again, lowest power. What's the greatest common factor of 3x plus 4 to the 2 thirds and 3x plus 4 to the negative 1 third? The smaller one to the negative one third. And then I just see what is remaining. I'm going to go left to right, everybody, and all I'm going to do is fill in what's remaining after I've pulled this out. So ready? Last time. 
Did I take some or all of the two out? All of it. So there's a factor of one, but I don't need it in this case. Did I take some or all of the x out? I took all of it out. So there's no x there. Did I take some or all of the 3x plus 4 to the 2 thirds out? I only took some of it out because look, everybody, I took out something smaller. So that means I still have 3x plus 4 is in there. What's that 3x plus 4 going to be raised to? I take the original exponent, 2 thirds, minus this smaller exponent right here, negative 1 third, and I see what it's equal to. Subtracting a negative, just like adding a positive. So this ends up being 3 thirds, which means it's just 1. So it's just to the first. And it's no coincidence, of course, some of the operations and the things you're going to do in the next levels of mathematics is what produces these values. Okay, so it's just 3x plus 4 to the first. I keep going to the right. The next thing is that plus right there. And then I look at the 4. Did I take some or all of the 4 out? I only took some of it out. There's still a 2 in there. Did I take some or all of the x squared out? Well, I only took some of it out. There's still an x in there. And did I take some or all of the 3x plus 4 to the negative 1 third out? I took all of it out. There it is, the whole thing. So are there any 3x plus 4s remaining? No. So just working left to right, you can see how nice that plays out. And when I clean this up, everybody, watch what happens. The 2 times the x is fine. This has a negative exponent, so I'm going to deal with that momentarily. This Combining like terms cleans up to 5x plus 4. And because that had a negative exponent, it comes to the bottom. And there is your answer. Same exact expression, written in exact form, positive exponent. Beautiful. All right, everybody, I'm going to stop right there. Look it over. Let me know if I can re-explain it in any way for you. Thank you.